Hey everybody, how are you doing? I'm Eric Erlock, and welcome to Asian Philosophy. This is uh, an intro to the syllabus and schedule for Berkeley City College Asian Philosophy Phil 37 for the spring semester of 2021. However, I will probably leave this up as the intro video for further semesters. So, uh, in order to take the class online or in person, um, please bookmark the page for the class on my website. My website is ericgerlach.com, um, E-R-I-C-G-E-R-L-A-C-H.com. Uh, please Google my name or what have you, find my website, and then in the courses, the first link in the menu, please find Asian Philosophy and bookmark that page. I am going to be putting up video lectures, including on this YouTube channel, but on my website, and there is a page of the video lectures and assignments and everything you need to know for the course up under Courses Asian Philosophy and bookmark that syllabus schedule page, which does have all the videos and assignments on it. So this is a short intro video, and I'm going to add this to the beginning of the playlist. And in this class, I finished doing Buddhist philosophy last semester. And I actually have many lectures on Indian and Chinese philosophy and Zen, which is very much Taoism plus Buddhism equals Zen in China, Japan, and Korea, and elsewhere. All over the place. California here is... I have many videos already up for Buddhist philosophy. I only have to add, actually for this class videos on Confucius, Mozart, uh, and some Chinese philosophy, as well as continue to crank out, uh, <laughs> continue to crank out videos on Indian philosophy and Buddhism and Zen, because actually I've already done a lot of uh, Indian and Chinese philosophy videos last semester, and I can use those again and again, because actually I'm going to use those for logic, and I'm going to use some of those for Buddhist philosophy, as well as for Asian philosophy. This is a good point uh, to say that what this class is, what is this class and what isn't this class? Well, the world has major traditions of thought. They have major cultures of this and that. You've heard of the ancient Greeks. There's Socrates, Plato. They were decently infamous, famous amongst the Greeks. Socrates says he's going to go bug Homer and Hesiod, the ancient poets who gave Greek people their common culture, and buy, or at least wrote it down or read it, uh, sang it aloud, that he's going to go annoy them for a while up in the pure lands of ancient Greece. They're like, oh, God, you know, this guy, oh, the gods, this, this guy's coming is that you have the Greeks, you also have two major traditions of ancient thought, also, you know, medieval, modern, stretching back thought, which is India and China. Now, there also is Africa, Egypt. I like talking about Egyptian philosophy. Eastern philosophy is not so much Egypt, nor is it so much Greece. In fact, some people tend to include Islam and Islamic culture, Muslims, Muslims, uh, I believe it is more correct to pronounce Muslim, but again, people pronounce things variously, and you can't stop that, that basically there I include Islamic civilization with my lectures and studies of modern European and ancient Greek philosophy, because in a certain sense, Greco-Roman Islamic Christian stuff is very much the Greek and then Roman and Christian traditions and how those are interlapping and interweaving. There are Nestorian Christians in China who are not near Greece and have been ancient times. But this is a class about Indian and Chinese philosophy. The reason it's a class about Indian and Chinese philosophy, as well as Tibetan, Korean, and Japanese philosophy, is because the world has major traditions of thought, Greece, Greek thought definitely went Western and all and westward and all over the place, and Indian thought very much merged with Chinese thought in the East, and all that became Indian Chinese philosophy is some Confucianism is Chinese, Buddhism in China and Japan is very Indian Chinese. So in fact, what we're doing in this class is this is an introduction to the basic thoughts and history of Indian and Chinese thought, and that is because Greek thought is and isn't very Western and European and interrelated with a bunch of other cultures. So essentially, and it is too simple to say the world consists of Egyptian and Greek and Indian and Chinese thought, essentially this is a class on Indian and Chinese thought because I have other classes on Greek thought, European thought, and I work Islamic thought more into the Greek and European classes. I am saying that explicitly because some East Asian philosophy classes, which are uh, Phil 37 in California, probably lettered and numbered differently elsewhere, other states of the Union and around the world. Sometimes that is Islamic, Indian, and Chinese thought and the roots of all that. 
I leave those uh, Islamic. Uh, I leave the world of Islam, which does interconnect with India, obviously, and a lot. I tend to parse things how I do, which is that I tend to look at Greece, India, and China as uh, er uh, eras of excellent, awesome, interesting, strange, terrible, if you like, philosophy. And so we have a lot of Indian and Chinese thought in this class. Not so much Greek or Islamic thought, but I will interconnect things and relate things for you. So actually for this class, uh, I just gave the, uh, yesterday morning, I gave the intro syllabus talks for logic and for modern European thought. Last semester I did Greek and Buddhist thought. I really enjoy being able to teach several different classes like this, and I get offered these sorts of classes each semester. In fact, it is very much a common rotation. I teach 20A and 20B, Greek and then European, and I also get to teach Buddhist, which is Indian and Chinese thought, as well as Asian, uh, Asian philosophy, which is Indian and Chinese thought. So, how is this different from my Buddhist philosophy class? Well, as you could tell, um, Buddhist philosophy centers a lot on Buddhism. It has a lot of Taoism in my Buddhist philosophy class because I have several hours of lecture on Taoism for you already, which leads into Buddhism in China and Japan, which I actually have to do better videos, more videos, some videos, perhaps, on... And I'm going to add those to the playlist. But what is going to happen um, is I am giving you an intro talk in this class, unlike for the logic and the modern European classes, I have yet to do the intro, I have yet to do the first and second lectures for the logic class, and I have yet to do the Descartes and Spinoza lectures for the modern European class. In fact, I'm going to do a West, East, Mideast lecture for the European class. And in fact, I may decide to change, you know, thinking outside uh, the box here, I may decide to include that lecture as course material for this class as well. I can massage the material at will here. Um, I can easily give you a, an intro talk on that, which I will have done very soon, today or tomorrow, uploaded, etc. For our purposes, um, I have actually uploaded mo many of the videos, lectures, for you guys already last semester. So, uh, you can actually go ahead and watch and read a lot of the lectures already. The other two classes have yet to wait for a bunch of the stuff. Um, but I have to add a lot for this class, but actually many of the videos are already there. So you can actually start studying a lot of the intro to Indian thought. A lot of the first component of the class is going to be Indian thought. A lot of that is already up there. I am going to add other videos to it. In fact... I, I need to add a video on Ashoka, the sort of uh, Buddhist Constantine of India, which who uh, his grandfather, uh, Chandra, uh, I'm going to get my names all mixed up again, um, but basically his grandparents were involved with Alexander back and forth in warring. We're going to get to all of that, um, and I'll have my notes in front of me as I work through that material, which is actually even recent to me and I've uh, added over the last few years. So... We're going to get to fleshing out more of India, but actually I have my intro Hindu talks um, and my Jain and my basic Buddha already up there in this playlist that you could be watching on the syllabus schedule main Asian philosophy page right now. So you can go ahead and watch the Indian lectures and start to look through that. However, I am going to very soon do a Western, Mideast, Eastern talk for the modern European class. Again, uh, I will work something like that either into this playlist or into the talks as we start in with the material. I also, in my talks on Hinduism, already have plenty of similar words where I tell you about how Indian thought is important and we don't do it enough justice. One of the things I often point out in taking an East Asian or Asian philosophy class like Phil 37 at BCC is that a lot of it, look through course catalogs in major universities, 20A is Greek, 20B is European, it is not entirely inappropriate to study the Greco-Roman Christian tradition more so as this civilization, these people here, and then have 20A and 20B be requirements for every philosophy major. However, Phil 37 is an elective. You can take it to continue your philosophy major, but not uh, fulfill major, you can fulfill core extra elective requirements for the philosophy major. It isn't actually the core required classes that where you need an East Asian philosophy class. And while increasingly, and at Cal myself back in the day, a few years ago now, I got to teach, I got to take, and that's the oatmeal, not the comic strip. 
I got to take a full co- uh, year of Chinese philosophy as an undergrad, which I'm very thankful for. I still know since then, almost no one ever gets to offer an Indian philosophy class as an Indian philosophy class at any major American university or college. I met one, I may be mistaken, but in my life, I can tell you, not meeting everyone, I've met one woman who teaches, I believe I ran about this in one of the soon, uh, which you will watch hopefully, Indian philosophy videos. I've met one professor who teaches Indian philosophy. She told me while I was working at a library front desk, she says, uh, I teach Indian philosophy. I said, you're teaching an Indian philosophy class, not Asian philosophy, which this class is Indian, not Chinese, Indian. She's like, yes, Indian philosophy class. I'm like, wow, where? She said Fresno. I'm like, okay then. You know, I, again, don't see Cal or Stanford offering Indian philosophy as Indian philosophy. But Greek and Chinese increasingly are, but Chinese would not be a core requirement. It would be a separate, I believe in uh, Cal's 153. Um, and yeah, upper division, you know, you can take some Chinese philosophy. I think uh, the numbers work out, you know, in different ways. I don't want to be critical of other people's systems or what have you. And I'm critical of BCC and everyone. And we're human. So, without being overly critical, it's hard to find Indian philosophy classes. And if you do find Indian and Chinese thought, it is often framed in terms of religion as religious studies and not as philosophy. Well, people have different takes on the Greeks. Some people, it was popular to say the Greeks were the first secular people in history. That was in the 1950s and before that, plenty. And since the 60s, it is much more popular to say the Greeks are rational and irrational, like everyone in academia, at least among some, it's mixed. I am very hardcore about saying the Greeks are rational, irrational people. That's Nietzsche said that in the 1800s. No, the Greeks didn't just revel in the rational and the bounded. They loved Dionysus, irrationality. I'll get to Nietzsche uh, a little in and out of the course of these talks. But, with all of that, people aren't simply rational in the West or the East. They like mysticism in both places. They like science in both places. It really isn't the West or the East as it's been cast, and a lot of people have said that, but we still live in a time where you can easily find Greek and European thought presented as secular, rational thought that's successful with science, math. And then Eastern thought is kind of mystical, kind of uh, hippie-ish religion, somewhat. I come from the Haight-Ashbury. I was born and raised in the Haight-Ashbury. And I'm a little proud of that and try not to be too much. But it is sort of a place where sort of, well, Indian and Chinese th- stuff is kind of groovy. Islamic thought is a border, uh, shares a border with Europe. They share a border with India and China. Islam is somewhat the enemy to those who share the borders. But again, as somebody said, the grandfather problem, your neighbor of your neighbor, if you all blast rock music, is your friend. That other guy can turn it down. So actually, Islam between people kind of gets a bad rap with sharing borders. And then hippies can be into India and China and be like, whoa, that's mystical. And it's like, well, they're people <laughs> like Native Americans. They're they're not mystically of the earth. They're people like they're adult human beings, unless they're children, you know, and we're all technically continuously children. Yes, especially given politics. So. It does seem like Indian Chinese philosophy can just be taught as human thought. I am a very big fan of teaching Indian and Greek and Chinese thought side by side and saying, wow, human thought, look at it, it's amazing. I have a long, now decades long, it is sad, (laughs) but true. I have decades now of doing comparative Greek, Indian, Chinese thought and loving to rant and rave about that. And all I can tell you without getting into complexities, of course it's very similar human thought, but always different in each and every thinker with each and every thought. But it is positions of human thought. It's not entirely the same numbered positions, but there are striking similarities between Greek and Indian and Indian and Chinese and Chinese and Greek thought, such that as we continue to talk all of this out, we should offer more Greek and Indian and Chinese philosophy classes or history of thought classes in another department, co-department, what have you. And in doing all of that and developing curriculum, we really do need to understand more the history of human thought. And in the way that I'm ranting, and I rant elsewhere similarly, we don't yet have really a society here or elsewhere that studies human thought altogether as just human thought, we are slowly inching our way into it. Keep that in mind as we objectively use the sciences. We don't yet sort of feel human beings are entirely uh, sort of human and think like us and feel like us. Unfortunately, Wittgenstein is my favorite uh, modern philosopher. He did say, I don't know if Chinese people smile when they're happy. How would I know that? And he means not knowing any Chinese people. I do, you know. And so, of course, you would just feel and not explain to children. They would see 
and they'd feel. So you would see and feel by more experience that Greek and Indian and Chinese thought is alike. I really actually don't take time explaining that much other or anything like the bedrock basics other than weaving us through the history and showing the similarities and the differences, which I do find history is really the kind of antidote to ideology. The more and more history we really experience, the more and more we can see humanity as human. That's great. We can use empathy, words, imagination, anything you like, really. All interwoven. So that said, that is my little rant about Indian and Chinese philosophy, why people should study it more, and why you should hopefully watch the videos and continue on with this class. So for the purposes of this intro video, you should hopefully learn a bunch of Indian and Chinese ideas and history and thought. More so the history of thought than the history of India and China, of course. Uh, that is, unfortunately, for history departments, too. Uh, and the languages would be more for those associated departments for you. But in introducing you to the history of Indian and Chinese thought, this is really more of the complementary picture of world thought as a whole. One of the things I always bring up is uh, in uh, Buddhism... Christianity and Islam are the largest systems of thought that have existed in world history. Now, Christianity is very tied uh, the New Testament is written in Greek, not Aramaic, which means Greek thought is very much tied up with Christianity, Islam, Judaism, all of the that mess kind of mixture of cultures back and forth, which is and isn't Viking plenty, weirdly. And then you have also Indian and Chinese thought. So when I get into Greek and Indian and Chinese thought, Along with the Americas, we're talking about the world, and we're talking about the, the most popular populist movements, which isn't the Hopi, which isn't everyone, and we should constantly be, I like the work of Radin in the 1930s and 40s, he's talking about the Winnebago and the Hopi. All that's great, American pragmatism, more of that, when we're talking about Greek and Indian and Chinese thought as well as everything from the beginning, before literacy. That's a lot of the great thought of the world, and here there may be better or worse, but that's all of what people chose to write down as their central texts, along with science texts of recipes in Sumer and Egypt, put this with this, that with that, and then you get this thing. That's great. You also have ranting and raving humanities, and what is truth is one of those questions the Egyptians, Mayans, and others ask themselves, and the Greeks uh, are one of those people that is centrally celebrated, roots Christian Abrahamic culture. And so when we do Indian and Chinese philosophy complementing Greek thought, that's actually exposing people to the larger history of world thought and psychology, to human thought and the mind as best we can. I do like Zen Buddhism, which is Taoism plus Buddha, uh, Chinese Taoism plus Indian Buddhism coming in as a foreign export equals Zen Buddhism a lot. I ha already have all sorts of videos ranting when I add more to that. And the Zen folks say all is mind. That does not change. I do like that a lot. And you're going to hear me talk like that. You already can from previous recordings. Given all of that, I am, can show you a lot of Indian and Chinese thought and how that is the human mind you have regardless of what culture you're from. I do like doing that a lot. So that said, after this talk, you should probably uh, watch the talk, uh, well, the next talk in the playlist. Again, I will shift them slightly around, but I will try to do that sooner rather than later to not constantly upend everything. I already have the first few videos, at least the second, third, and fourth, that you should watch up about Indian philosophy. I'm going to add a video or two about Buddha, uh, early Buddha and Ashoka, some more about the Buddhist uh, short and long and mid-length short and long discourses. That's actually how they're organized. Buddhism organizes the early texts according to how long they are and then by subject, which is a wonderful organizing system. It's one possibility. Yeah, there's several that we've tried. All are somewhat terrible in human history, you know. Um, and them's one of them. So we're going to get a little bit more into Buddhist text, but you can go ahead and watch the Hindu and the Jain videos already. I have several hours on Hinduism and Jainism. Please First, bookmark this page, watch the videos in the playlist, read and follow along with the lecture links that are below this description, and you should bookmark this page. Read the online free readings assigned at the top of each lecture page each week. I will not tweak them much, and I'm going to get them in order, you know, over the next week or two in the later classes. If there are any, I do not require a paid textbook or reader, and uh, if you want a grade in the class, you are obviously welcome to watch and learn from my website uh, whether or not you're taking the course. 
But if you are going to get a grade in the course, then you should complete the assignments at your own pace and then turn them in by the end of the class. If you don't complete all three of the assignments, there are three essays assigned for this class, two four-page papers and an eight-page paper. Spend your time writing what you want to as you like carefully and enjoy the process and take your time, give yourself the time, and you will get a decent grade likely if you do all the work in the class. I am not the hardest grader, but I am forcing you to do a decent volume, a metric ton, you know, or 16 pages as it were of work. I do often mention to classes where I have them write essays. I didn't understand until grad school, but actually undergrad classes are walking you out to writing eventually altogether 16 pages. You then eventually get to humanities grad school if you ever do, and they say, write me a 30-page article, which or 30, you know, 16 twice is 32. So write me a 30-ish page article, which is an academic article about, um, if it's brilliant, it could be two pages. But, you know, a 30-page article is kind of a standard length of academic publishing, apparently. And so you can can just go ahead and crank, you know, at, uh, in grad school, a lot of classes are write a full article on whatever you want once you're through all the material and get it in by the end of class. We're not doing that. I'm not having you write a 30-page article. What we're doing is I'm walking you from two four pages to an eight page because that's uh, 16 pages. Yes, math, uh, math majors. 16 pages uh, walking towards, again, an upper division course, which is walking you out to 32 or so pages by eight pages and 16 page papers, doubling it out. That's actually what's going on. I didn't know that, you know, till I went the full distance there. I calculated very hard at the time also. So my job is to get these videos up and ready sooner in the course rather than later. I am thankful for the patience of the ethics class of the summer and then the Buddhist and Greek uh, philosophy classes last semester because I got most of the ethics stuff up kind of by the end. And then mid-semester, last semester, I got a lot of the videos up. But especially for you guys, I am on the ball. I have my whole rig up now. And so I'm going to be able to crank out the videos I need to, especially for this class. So please enjoy and go through the material. Um, please email me any questions you ever have. You're always welcome to email me and ask me questions about all of that. Questions about the assignments, the material, and email my Gmail and that the link's up there on the page. I have also a link to the BCC academic calendar. To mention, uh, the uh, oh, there are also optional group meetings. Um, for this class, this is my third of three classes, so on Wednesdays, 11 to noon, um, I am going to have a, an optional group meeting. Usually only one or two or three people show up. Um, you are not required to meet with me or video chat with me in order to complete the class. You are simply required to complete the assignments. However, if you want to talk to others, you are obviously welcome to email uh, others you know, I suppose you do not have the, uh, well, yes, and it is improper to be able to cold email everyone else in the class at all, but you can join the group meetings and you can, uh, email me to Zoom at another time if you cannot make the meetings. And of course, uh, well, yes, may only be able to give you uh, a little bit of time each week individually, but I am here and it is the pandemic still right now. So yeah, I've got some time. So that said... What we're going to cover in this class is quickly, I'm giving this intro, uh, you then have a, a decent amount of Indian thought and Hinduism to cover, including the Upanishads and the Indian epics a little bit, and then some orthodox, which is Hindu schools of thought, and then unorthodox Indian schools, including most famously Jainism, the Sharvakas, and Buddhism, the most popular of Indian philosophies, which is an unorthodox non-Hindu but Indian school of thought. Orthodox, Hindu, unorthodox, non-Hindu, Indian stuff. Buddhism, uh, then we will cover in Indian Tibet. I have yet to make some video lectures on that. I'm looking forward to that. Then we have Buddhism in China and Japan. Uh, then uh, we are going to, because we kind of have to be covering India and China all at once, um, and I have to parse that out, we're going to leave Buddhism for a tiny bit, and we're going to jump back in time a tiny bit to cover Chinese thought, the Hundred Schools, Confucius, Mencius, Sun Tzu, and Neo-Confucianism, and Mozart, and I've already got the Logicians, the School of Names people, because they're important for Taoism, along with Taoism, which I've already got the lectures up on, several hours actually, uh, which I hope, uh, yeah, please give me feedback and tell me what you think of all that, hopefully you like that. Basically, that covers the beginning of Chinese thought. I need to add some of those lectures in. 
and then we go onward to Zen Buddhism. Um, and finally, uh, after w I will add in a couple of lectures on Buddhism in Korea and Vietnam I wanted to add, which also work for the Buddhist philosophy class I did not manage to complete last semester. And then I'm also going to add some Chinese thought, which is specific, which is also Japanese thought. A lot of Chinese sources and Chinese thought becomes then Japanese and Vietnamese and Korean thought very much originating in China is we will cover warriors and strategy, and I'm going to cover a few Chinese and Japanese classic martial sources, including Sun Tzu, the art of war. There is Sun Tzu, uh, the Confucian, third in line from Confucius, and then there is Sun Tzu, who is the art of war strategist. It's slightly different, again, and I am a native English speaker, but slightly different Sun Tzu's uh, are ba the art of war guy and not. We're going to cover the art of war, the classic military strategy guide, not so much the spear motions, but the mind state and philosophy of it, which is very Taoist, very much be like water with your strategy. And it's all being thought of at the same time as Taoism, so perhaps these are the same people. And then we will also have a bit on Bushido, on Samurai, uh, and I will uh, a little bit of Musashi. I have yet to put the links I'm going to fix the links to the lectures and the material uh, today or tomorrow here. And yeah, the Asian syllabus page, the links work in the menu. Um, but yes, the links are yet to be live a little bit in the page. So that said, there are two four-page essays and an eight-page paper, typed double-spaced and emailed to me. Focus on an issue we cover. I have suggested topics, but pick a topic, uh, anything that you want to write about. I have a video, How to Write a Philosophy Essay, already embedded in the webpage. Please review that, uh, and then you can ask me questions about essay writing. That explains what I want and what I look for. And then try to stay on pace, give yourself time, try to complete. I am advising people, without trying to be too precisely quantitative, and then just at 28th, 29th. Try working at your own pace to complete at least one essay assignment for the class a month. So for the spring here, try to do the first essay by March, the second by April, and start the longer and third essay by May, giving yourself enough time to do the eight pages and uh, the other essays you may or may not have completed by the end of the class just before June. If this class is being taken in the fall, it wouldn't be when I'm recording it, but could be. Do the first essay by October, the second by November, and start the longer third essay by December. And so you're taking, uh, you're finishing it before the uh, before the class ends, before January, just before. And again, email me with questions and concerns, or if you need to zoom and chat. Please review the material, of course, in the syllabus before you ask me all the questions on the syllabus, which is infamous. But I am happy to chat, and you are welcome to ask me stupid questions and get stupid answers out of stupid me. So that said, that is pretty much the intro to the class. Um, I, you already, again, can watch a lot of the lectures already on Hinduism, Jainism, and the Sharvakas, which is some of the core intro material for the class. However, I am going to give a short talk on West, Mid East, and East, which I think I will include for this class because it can function for several classes, including this one, and is greater worldwide context, much of what I was ranting about before. And then you can proceed to work through the Hinduism, the Jainism, uh, the Sharvakas, the Buddhism, and then as I add more to the Buddhism and a bit more to the Chinese thought, uh, hopefully before you have the chance to try to get that far in the class. So I'm going to do the videos as soon as I can. Please uh, work at your own pace. Email me with anything and work out all three of the assignments and email them to me. Of course, if you want a grade or, uh, or if you want comments, you will get a grade and comments anyway on your work if you turn it in. But if you want more comments and detailed work with me on your writing, please, of course, give me time and arrange to chat with me at a, at a particular place about your paper, because, of course, I have many papers to read and many folks to talk to, many people to see. So, much happiness. Um, I will... Well, hopefully talk to you if you want to talk to me, and I will see if I ever see you, because I don't right now. <laughs>